Hello, hello. Hi, Drew. Hi, How are you? Doing fine. Sorry, I freaked <laughs> out. <laughs> A little tired, but it's good to be here. Oi, Ana. Oi, Davi. Tudo bem? <laughs> Tudo bem. Uh, hello. I can't you hear say? your talk. And Elisa, you talked about her in the last class. It's... Hi. Hi, Ana. So you see, Elisa, I've been talking about your herbarium in my classes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, oh I have this Hi, error because I've gotten into other sessions like 15 minutes early. <laughs> it's like, no, no. I know, no. I'm afraid we, we kept you late. I just realized that your session was right after this as we were keep staying late at the, the feminist spaces one. I think well, that's rush I kept over. looking off. I, you know, I kept walking around in circles and coming back and somebody is saying something interesting. So. Yeah, that was really a fascinating session. Mm -hmm. Well, it is one of the things I love about you, Alyssa, is your capacious curiosity. About what? Your capacious curiosity oh, is one of the things oh. I love about you. Yes. <laughs> and, Davi, and Davi, who knows you even better than I do, was nodding when I said it, so it must be true. Well... <laughs> No, anyway. The herbarium. We need well, to, we need to get it published. Herbarium. I agree with you, Davi. I agree. I've been, uh, I want a whole it. consortium to help me. I I talked to John Morgan Stern, my dear friend, for for months about it, and he just threw up his hands and said it's too big, you know. And I'm going well. I guess what I have to do is sit down and write a coherent yes uh, book proposal. But I think it could be done really beautifully with with pictures and illustrations, and I think yeah. it deserves to be done correctly, not just nice paper. I currently, have over twelve thousand. Like I would, if if I website. had if I had the herbarium as like a material object, I would sleep on it. It would probably be so beautiful. Like I just well, and I think <laughs> I think I should be able to sell this. I mean, it's clear that people yeah. are interested I, from the thousands of people who accessed it. True. So, and it's also the kind of thing that could be, uh, it's one of those things, Alyssa, where we've talked about, I think you and I have talked about this before, that we're in this moment of um, sort of hybrid books, uh, books that you don't know where to shelve. And um, yeah. those are my favorite kind of books. This, I mean, this is not, uh, this, this example isn't comparable, but a book like H is for Hog. But where do you shelf that book? It's a number of different things. And also, this book would be of interest to people who are gardeners, you know, flower, you know, you know horticulturalists wolf people yeah. i mean it'd be the kind of book like, that i i am increasingly very interested in this idea of putting people writing the kinds of books where they show up in the bookstore and the booksellers have to say where the hell do we put this because it could go in five places yeah i, I like I, those kinds of books and Alyssa, i do want to talk to you more about sig harvey and sig harvey's works i know well you mentioned this person before and i didn't follow up and i'm no, no, no it's, just... and we'll have to I'll have to send you some Sig Harveys for your for your birthday or something. But there's uh -huh. um, she's a photographer and she takes pictures, all kinds of, I think, beautiful photographs that, that you would like. But she also has these artist books, these artist books that she does with these photographs oh, and no. text and essay form. And I think yes. when I when I think about the herbarium, I think of one of those beautiful, you know, it's like a like a this beautifully illustrated or, you know, photographic anatomy in, in yeah. so many ways um i don't know i think it could be really beautiful i'm just wanted to know if you can listen to me 
Is everything okay? Is it working? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Everything's okay. working. Okay, great. great. And I saw, I briefly saw Suzanne. There she is. Ah. Yep. Suzanne. We see you. Scanning. But she's not, I don't know if she's hearing us or not. Yeah, we hear us, Suzanne. She might have muted us. I don't know. It's weird. Suzanne, honey. <laughs> Send her something in the chat. Yeah, well, she, she's not muted, but she may be connecting. She's connected to the audience. Well, she may have. Yeah, she can't hear us, obviously. Yeah. Well, she's set up as co host. Um, yeah. I wonder if her speakers are just off on her computer. Maria, que saudade que eu tava de você. Oh, Me te ver um pouquinho. <risos> Tudo bom. Tudo, seis meses falando com você, tanto tempo que eu não falo. É. Saudade. Olha, sobrevivendo aqui, mas tá tudo bem. <risos> Bom te ver também. I sent her a message. Okay. Saying, we can see you, but you don't appear to hear us or speak to us. So... All right, it's five. People are still coming in. We'll wait just maybe a minute or so. And what I will do is I will introduce the four of you all at once and you'll take it away and you will do your thing and we will have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so let's wait just a moment or so. More people coming in. We are recording, right? Yeah, we are. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you? Yes. Yes. Suzanne, we hear I, you. Finally. Can uh, you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you, Suzanne. Oh, okay. great, Suzanne. Oh, Hi. Hello, everyone. Lovely to hear your voice, Suzanne. Oh, I call you totally nothing. accidentally. I'm sorry. What did you do? Okay. I accidentally you. called you. Oh, that's okay. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> but I, I hung up. Want, I want you to know I'm in bed. It's freezing cold here. And it's just dawn. And so I thought I'll stay in bed and do it that way. You none of you mind that, do you? Oh. We have Sorry. another uh, Australian participant who uh, has been uh, in bed, I think. Uh, as well, so and bundled up just like you to her ear. Yeah. I'm lying I'm... on my bed, Suzanne. Oh, hi, Jane. Hello. Hi. And, and you're all I'm smarter on my than bed that. too. It's cold in Scotland. I bet. Oh, wow. I don't remember last year being this cold. Hi, Javi. Oh, there he is. Hi, darling. So good to see you, Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah. Suzanne, we were just talking about you this morning. We were just talking about what? We were talking about you this morning at breakfast and how oh. delighted we were that you stayed up with us. You stayed up for like three or four days last year straight. As a, in, right. what, a, I know. what a delight. You were the, the most vivacious of us all, all through the conference oh, last God. year. Ooh. Well, if I ever come frostbite, you never know what happens. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and start with these bios. Uh, so uh, welcome to this sure, sure to be amazing panel. Um, and I have to just editorialize and say that these four people are four of my favorite human beings. So I'm mm. delighted to be chair chairing this panel. Um, so, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to mutilate the Portuguese. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, Maria Oliveira has been a professor at the Federal University of Accra since 2013, teaches courses on English literature, British theater, and post-colonial literature. Now she teaches at Federal Univ University of Paraiba. 
her dissertation, Women Representation on Virginia Woolf's Works, a dialogue between her political and aesthetic discourse was published by Paco Editorial in Portuguese and Brazil, in English by Lambert Academic Publishing, and in Spanish by Cuarto Proprio. She has just finished her postdocs project at the University of Toronto on Wolf and the Brazilian Woman Writers. Her last publications include Conversas com Virginia Woolf, organized by her, Davi Pinho, and Nisea Nogueira. Uh, Voces Femininas, organized by her, Mesa Cristina Dorado and Patricia Moralvo. And A Prosa Poetica de Virginia Woolf, organized by her, Patricia Moralvo and Lucas Borba. She also has a chapter on, on the Edinburgh Companion to Virginia Woolf and Com Contemporary Global Literature, edited by Jeannie Dubino, Paulina Pajak, Catherine W. Hollis, Celise Lipka, and Vara Nevero. Davi Pinho holds a PhD in Comparative Literature uh, from Birkbeck U uh, University of London and is currently a professor of English Literature at Rio de Janeiro State University. He is the author of, thanks for the translation, Davi, Images of the Feminine Virginia Woolf 2015 and co-editor of several collections in the fields of English and Comparative Literature, such as Eros Technology Transhumanism from 2015, Conversations with Virginia Woolf 2020. His most recent recent publications include a chapter in the Edinburgh Companion to Virginia Woolf and Contemporary Global Literature, and an essay on Woolf and Shakespeare in the Brazilian collection, What You Need to Know About Shakespeare Before the World Ends, which might be my new favorite book title uh, from 2021. He is on the editorial advisory board for the Virginia Woolf Variations book series from Edinburgh University Press. And Alyssa K. Sparks, retired after 35 years of teaching at English and Women's Studies at Clemson University in South Carolina. She continues to do academic research and publish on flowers and gardens in the work of Virginia Woolf and on Woolf's connections with and similarities to Georgia O'Keeffe. And last but certainly not least, Suzanne Bellamy, who got her PhD from the University of Sydney. She is an Australian studio artist and writer working on Woolf and Australian internet slash international modernism. Wolf and Stein art fusions, sculptural text boxes called abstract machines. She's currently preparing a chapter on abstracts, uh, abstract machines for a book uh, from the uh, 2018 Sorbonne SEM conference and Wolf and Australian Modernism in Edinburgh Global Wolf, edited by Jeannie Dubino and Paulina Pajak. And I might editorialize as well, Suzanne is a genuine force of nature. So. <laughs> I will turn this over to this illustrious panel and take it away. Hi, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> oh, yes, love me to share my slides, please. Uh -huh. Okay, perfect. So I must uh, remember, I must, it's important to remind you that this is a research for a lifetime. What I am presenting here is just the beginning of a life, a long life work, okay? Thank you very much. So my, uh, my <clears throat> article, my paper is Shakespeare's Legacy in Virginia Woolf, a Feminist Revision. Much has been written about Shakespeare presence and Woolf's works in Brazil. Now, uh, you can uh, you can hold on. Thank you. In Brazil, Davi Pinho uh, analyzes how Woolf makes use of the bar signature in his writing. Josenildo da Silva establishes a comparative study between Mrs. Henry and King Lear, while Lindbergh Campus develops his research on the presence of Shakespeare in Orlando and the Waves. In English-speaking countries, also much has been written about it. <clears throat> In Virginia Woolf and the Literature of Renaissance, Alice Fox dedicates a chapter on Shakespeare and Woolf. Theodore Langland in Virginia Woolf reads The Great Wigan. <clears throat> Questions How can we learn about Shakespeare from Woolf's readings of him? 
Christina Frola and Virginia Woolf as Shakespeare's sister observes how Woolf projects in her writing an image of the writer all over her works. My aim is to analyze how Woolf establishes a feminist critique of Shakespeare, especially in a role of one's own. Is it possible to talk about a literary anxiety on Woolf is in relation to Shakespeare? <clears throat> that Schwartz, in thinking back through our mothers, Virginia Woolf reads Shakespeare, understands that Woolf subverts the relations poet muse when creating her muse, Judith Shakespeare, reflecting upon the literary borders and rethinking the heter heterosexual plot. Marianne Nolte suggests that the uses of Shakespeare involves a tribute, but also a feminist and critical rewriting. Another important aspect of the role of one's own is when Wolf mentions the relation between Chloe and Olivia, subverting the <clears throat> plot of Anthony and Cleopatra, in which Cleo, Chloe likes Olivia and they both share a lab and change the future of the literature. Julia Briggs indicates us that probably the name Olivia is taken from Twelfth Night, in which Olivia falls in love with Viola, with, uh, a girl dressed as a man. <clears throat> the Voyage Out could be read as an interpretation of the Tempest. Davi, pode passar. The Voyage Out could be read as an interpretation of the Tempest, as both explore a world on the border of the empire. Mrs. Ellery, a character in The Voyage Out, discusses with Mr. Price about Shakespeare, and they quote a fragment from The Tempest, quote, full phantom five thy father lies, end of quote, from act one, scene two, a moment when where Ariel sings a song, and the same fragment is repeated during the first meeting between Terence and Rachel. Shakespeare can be used in the voyage out as a representative of the English identity, showing how the effects of the empire expansion also have a straight implication in the culture that is consumed by the same people. In night and day, measure for measure is not the only play, it's not the only play quoted by Wolf. Many critics have compared the novel Midsummer Night's Dream in relation to the change of couples and many references to dreams. Mary Nolte finds echoes of As You Like It, since Catherine is compared to Rosalind. Quote, and why should she read Shakespeare? Pode passar na vie, por favor. In quote, and why should she read Shakespeare? Since she is Shakespeare. Rosalind, you know, and of fault. Cordelia can also be compared to Catherine as Lear's good daughter, as well as Antigone is in relation to Oedipus. In another fragment, Wolf writes, quote, Millet is studies sorry, Millet made his studies of it for Ophelia. Some say that is the best picture he, he ever painted, end of quote. John Millet, pode passar, Davi, is a Victorian painter famous for his painting on Ophelia, one of the images that consecrated her, the character throughout the, the years. It can be noted that Wolf tries to bring her protagonist closer to Shakespeare's heroines, 
such as Cortina, Ophelia, or Rosaline. All critics agree that Jacob's room was inspired by Wolf's brother, Pancho Pasanabi Tobi. In a letter to him on November 5th, 1901, Wolf writes about the challenge of reading Shakespeare when she was reading when she was reading Simonin, while Toby, as a student in Cambridge, was devouring Shakespeare entirely, entirely. Quote, I still feel a little oppressed by his greatness, I suppose, end of quote. Simonin appears both in Shakespeare and in Mrs. Dalloway, but with a different meaning and fragments. Both narratives have as background the death of a soldier in the First World War. In this case, both represent an analogy of the dead young men killed during the war. In Jacob's room, the fragment is, quote, Hang there like a fruit, my soul, until the tree dies. From Act 5, Scene 5, in the dialogue in which Imogen questions the reasons why she, he took her out of his life, and Possumus shows his regret. In Mrs. Dalloway, Pajpasadabi, Wolf refers to Simonin with the verses. Fear no more the heat of the sun from Act 4, Scene 2, which refers to the funeral, to the funeral song Imogen's brother sing besides her body, thinking she's dead when she's disguised as Fidel. Imogen's possible death refers to the tragic plot involving Septimus Smith and the verses are repeated all over the book. The repetition of Shakespeare's verses create an atmosphere in the narrative. At the same time, it contributes for the poetic rhythm which connects both plots, Mrs. Dalloway and Septimus. Othello also appears in Mrs. Dalloway at different moments in the text, quote, if to war now to die, it were now the, to be most happy. End of quote. From Act Two, Scene One. This fragment, quoted at the moment when Clarissa expresses her enthusiasm when she shares the same spaces as Sally Seaton. The same words are repeated at the end of the book when Clarissa understands the meaning of Satchmo's death. Into the lighthouse, put Passana B. Into the lighthouse, Mrs. Ramsey reads one of Shakespeare's sonnets, Sonnet 98, while Mr. Ramsey thinks about the novel The Antiquarian by Walter e. Scott. Shakespeare poetry invades Wolfian poetic prose, contributing to the rhythm of the narrative, but also to emphasize the construction of Mrs. Ramsey as the main character, conferring a more profound meaning to her. In Orlando, Pajpasanabi, the protagonist watches a street performance of Othello, especially the scene in which Desdemona is killed by Othello. Orlando feels as if he was killing Sasha with his own hands when, when he quotes a fragment of the play from Act 5, Scene 2. In Chapter 4, in Orlando, there are echoes of a sentence by Edgar in King Lear and from Act 4, Scene 6. Since from the beginning in Chapter 1, Orlando is a, is a great Shakespeare admirer, but Wolf represents him as a simple man, quote, a rather fat, 
spread her shabby bed, subverting the aura of an unreachable altar. While in a room of one's own, Wolf was reflecting in her literary borders. In Orlando, she, she was re-evaluating her relation to her literary fathers, Shakespeare, with his quote, androgynous and incandescent mind, end of quote, represents not only an inspiration for Wolf, but also a great, cha a great challenge that she needed to re-elaborate. In the waves, Wolf mentions Sonnet 7, Pode Passar na Me, to talk about the history of the British Empire. Besides that, there are echoes of other plays and sonnets. For instance, a fragment of Twelfth Night, quote, come away, come away, death, from Act 2, Scene 4. In the years, there is a dialogue on Shakespeare's plays, on characters, pode passar a me. One character mentions Midsummer Night's Dream and As You Like It, plays that were probably staged during the spring in the village. The year is 1911, and, <coughs> and Eleanor has just come back from Spain. Julia Briggs in, in this says that in this moment, Eleanor experiments a sense of belonging, all that represents the sense of English identity, the beauty of the English language and its literature, all that was being questioned by the moment Wolf was writing the book when imperialist dictators were rising to power and putting at stake all the values. Questions that are also discussed in Between the Acts. And in Between the Acts, Wolf in her attempt, attempt to reconstruct the history makes a feminist revision of Shakespeare's plays from the perspective of Miss Latrobe. Briggs states that the sentence scraps, words, and fragments derives from Trollius' griefs at President's betrayal from Act 5, Scene 2. Ms. Latrobe summarizes the Elizabethan era in only 30 minutes, and it's up to the reader to discover the fragments mentioned following the tips of the playwright. It's important to emphasize that Robert Sawyer states that Wolf creates a modernist Shakespeare, represents different words and aesthetics. The medieval era, the Elizabeth, Elizabethan, the Victorian, and the modernist. From this point of view, we can think today of a postmodern, postcolonial, post-pandemic Shakespeare and a global one. In my, my final considerations, I understand that Shakespeare's legacy and Wolf's works as a feminist revision when she decided to create a female equivalent of Shakespeare in order to re-elaborate her literary anxiety, to fill in the gaps in the female literary tradition. Wolf uses his per Sorry, Wolf uses his poetry to reinforce her poetic prose, as she uses his comedy of manners to create an atmosphere and a theatrical scenario as a stage for her characters, while she uses the great tragedy to confer a tragic death in her narratives. Wolf as a reader, critic, novelist, and a feminist, reads Shakespeare in different ways. There are different levels of meaning for the use of the playwright, going from the most superficial to the most profound. Wolf not only read Shakespeare, but she also saw different 
productions in different moments of her life. When she was younger, she felt more challenged by the bard. But during the 30s, as a more mature writer, she was ready to face this challenge and reevaluate her works, rebuilding the literary history from a feminist point of view, as she did along all her career. Pode passar, Davi. Obrigada. Thank you. Pode passar. And my references. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Are, are we switching now to Davi? That's the order I had, is that right? Yeah. Okay, good. I'll just start by saying, hi everyone. It's lovely to be here with all of you. So good to see you all, the three other panelists and Drew. I'll say that um, there was a minor mistake in my bio. My PhD was proudly, <laughs> Um, hard-earned at WEG, the Rio de Janeiro State University, through which I did a sandwich program at Birkbeck. And it's our fault because we usually sign in Brazil, WEG dash Birkbeck. So it's okay. I just wanted to put it out there. I'm going to jump right in. So I stay within our 15 minute break. I was quite nervous sharing the screen, Maria, for you. So that's why I'm not going to do that now. <laughs> just going to read the paper. <laughs> okay, so a phantasmagorical Shakespearean tradition in Virginia Woolf. All research in the human sciences particularly in a historical context, necessarily has to do with signatures, affirms the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben in his essay on the theory of signatures and its legacies from Paracelsus to Foucault. Never mere signs, signatures open up zones of undecidability in Agamben's words. An artist's signature, or the signature on a coin, if we follow Agamben, does not merely express a semiotic relationship between a signance or signifier and a signatin or signified, Rather, it's what persisting in this relation without coinciding with it, displaces and moves it into another domain, thus positioning it in a network of pragmatic and hermeneutic relations." End quote. Between signatures and things then, there are ghostly presences as Brazilian scholar Isabella Pinho offers, after whose traces we run, undoing in the process the illusory stability of a name as a closed sign and showing this other domain, this network of relations in which the name as signature finds currency. William Shakespeare's name as signature, already in its first folio print in 1623, appears as not of an age, but for all time in the prophetic verses of Ben Jonson and garners the sense of original genius in romantic reproductions in Germany, England, Brazil, and elsewhere. Shakespeare's canonization as a national poet is well documented by Michael Dobson, who shows that by Garrick's 1769 Stratford Jubilee, Badolatry had done away with Shakespeare's words and had consolidated the author's signature as, in Dobson's words, both symbol and exemplar of British national identity. Reading Shakespeare's signature between the 1660s, 60s and the 1760s, Dobson goes on to conclude that, and I quote, a century of the rewriting and repositioning of Shakespeare's plays within British culture culminates in a festive entertainment, marking in spectacular fashion their accession to an unprecedented symbolic value, which renders their actual contents irrelevant, drowned out in the noise of national rejoicing. It's no surprise then that Virginia Woolf's modernist scene produces this signature differently, asking by and for whom, or for whose purpose Shakespeare's name was signed. If women in Wolf's time had and wanted no country, as even her nationality was at risk after the 1914 British Nationality and Status of Aliens Act, could she adopt a national poet? When invited in 2020 to write a personal essay to the Brazilian collection, What You Need to Know About Shakespeare Before the World Ends, edited by Shakespearean scholars Fernanda Mediano and Leona Leon, 
It was on Shakespeare, on Wolf's reading of Shakespeare's signature as gesture that I decided to dwell. After all, scattered across her writings, as Maria has shown, Wolf does produce a vast gloss that, ambivalent as many scholars have noticed, gives primacy to the vitality of the Shakespearean word over the overwhelming weight of his name as signified. But I had just read Elizabeth Outka's chapter on Wolf and viral modernism, and one image had stuck with me. It was 1925, and Virginia Woolf had suddenly passed out, suffering from a familiar fever. As Outka notes, Woolf was plagued by influenza before, during, and after the peak of the 1918-19 pandemic, finding herself in intermittent isolation several times. It struck me that the 1925 fever was the context of one of Woolf's notable readings of Shakespeare as signature, and that from her own lockdown of sorts, Wolf produced an implicit guide on how to read the Bard's absent presence, one that has its roots thoroughly documented by Theodore Langwand in The Great William, writers reading Shakespeare, for instance. This guide is found in On Being Ill, the essay first published in 1926 in the New Criterion at the invitation of her friend, T.S. Eliot, as Wolf was recovering. Read in the context of the break with mere representation in search for new paths for fiction in times of futility and anarchy and at its phrasing, Wolf's call for the reader to create a new language, primitive, subtle, sensual, obscene, as well as, and this is Wolf, a new hierarchy of the passions, love must be deposed in favor of a temperature of 104, echoes modernist concerns in essays such as Modern Fiction or Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, for instance. Charles Hendricks affirms that for Wolf, as for Sontag later on, illness marks a change in citizenship. All living people have dual citizenship, one in the realm of health and the other in the realm of disease, formulates Sontag. And Wolf, before, also decomposes the world among those who limp from an army of the uprights to the community of recumbent deserters. Directly, the bed is called for, Wolf says, we cease to be soldiers in the army of the uprights we become deserters. Being ill then becomes a form of resistance to the army of the healthy, which packs a lot to Wolf's reader since the critique of patriarchy and militarism that she develops throughout her career makes her oeuvre a true feminist intervention in the context of modernist debates. Discerning between a healthy mode of reading and writing and an ill one which favors sound before meaning, sensation before intelligence, that is intuition before erudition, Wolf inserts the problem of the signature Shakespeare at the center of the modernist discussion. I quote Wolf, rashness is one of the properties of illness, outlaws that we are, and it is rashness that we need in reading Shakespeare. Shakespeare is glassing flyblown. Flyblown, a paternal government might well forbid writing about him as they put his monuments at Stratford beyond the reach of scribbling fingers. With all this buzz of criticism aroused, one may hazard one's conjectures privately, make one's notes in the margin, but knowing that someone else has said it before or said it better, the zest is gone. Illness, in its kingly sublimity, sweeps all that aside and leaves nothing but Shakespeare in oneself. What with his overweening power and an overweening arrogance, the barriers go down, the knots run smooth, the brain rings and resounds with Lear or Macbeth, and even Coleridge himself squeaks like a distant mouse. Perhaps even Eliot squeaks like a distant mouse. Wolf might be telling her friend and editor. From confinement as, out, as an outlaw, that is outside the law of a paternal government and on the margins of his army that has Shakespeare as a national hero, so out of reach of the untrained and therefore rash hands of someone who was not part of A.C. Bradley's academic critical scene as the statue of the Bard in Stratford-upon-Avon was from the people, Wolfe says that the only way to read Shakespeare is to indulge in sounds, in the smell, the taste of the Shakespearean word in detriment of its signature as national summation. There's a gender dispute bit here between the army of the uprights constantly erects and this community of outsiders, outlaws around Shakespeare. Julia Briggs, writing for the Shakespeare survey in an essay she goes on to collect in reading Virginia Woolf, opens up several polyvalent references that expose, in Briggs's words, Woolf's complex and at times uneasy relationship with Shakespeare. 
Within the scene of Wolf's mid 1920s investigation of illness in Mrs. Dalloway, for example, Septimus Warren Smith goes to war to save an England, which consisted almost entirely of Shakespeare's plays and Miss Isabel Pole in a green dress walking in a square. This official Shakespeare, a mark of English identity, was the great captain used in the nationalist campaign that Wolf refuted in, in her radical pacifism. He was a patrilineal legacy handed down from father to son. And this realization came early on to Virginia Stephen. Wolf's scholarship has pointed out, as Hermione Lee describes, that while Toby ruthlessly dominated her with his confident certainties about Shakespeare, this is um, Hermione Lee, Wolf felt the need to oppose and resist his point of view and make her own judgments. At stake here is a family dispute around a version of, quote unquote, the great William, which Virginia Stephen could call her own without feeling truly heir to the part. It is also worth remembering that Sidney Lee's monumental life of William Shakespeare was born in the editing work with Leslie Stephen for the Dictionary of National Biography. Noting this gendered reception of Shakespeare at the Stephen family home, Briggs wonders whether the reason why Wolf never wrote an essay specifically on Shakespeare was because she understood that doing so would imply crossing into male-only territory. Emphasizing this ambiguity, Briggs notes that in the first draft of To the Lighthouse, when confronted by Charles Tensley's misogyny, Lily Briscoe goes on to elaborate that Tensley's arrogance would come from the fact that, and I quote, every man has Shakespeare and women have not. But this sort of glossing over is, of course, to write about Shakespeare, since like Agamben, Wolf seems to be meditating in Maggie Helm's words on the material and historical conditions of signatures as gestures, rather than on signature as summations. And if you go back to Mrs. Dalloway, is it not Shakespeare that crosses both Clarissa and Septimus thoughts while echoing the Shakespearean invitation to life that Wolf turns into a chorus of sorts in her novel, Fear No More the Heat of the Sun? In this reference to Cymbeline, which jumps from one character to the other, wouldn't Wolf be asking who's afraid or why they're afraid of William Shakespeare? Destabilizing Shakespeare's signature estimation for the British Empire and its oppressions of class and gender allows Wolf to recognize other traces and to create a story contiguous to that of her brother, real and metaphorical, so that she can open the signature Shakespeare as a gesture of difference, summoned by the very words of her Elizabethan countryman. If Shakespeare is androgynous, as Wolf states at the end of a room, recognizing the androgyny of his work, requires its deinstitutionalization through the reading and writing of the sisters and daughters of educated men who are not heirs to the bard, but to his silent sisters, no less historically true, if fictional, who burned at the stake, were locked in rooms and excluded from the public world. This exclusion of the sundry Judith Shakespeare's of history is the legacy bequeathed to Wolf as well as to her interlocutors at the colleges of Girton and Newnham Cranbridge, who, as we know, occupied a marginal position as they could not draw their degrees from her brother's Cambridge, being thus inside and outside in excess of the very institution. A Shakespeare read from the margin. This seems to be what Wolf does in Orlando, the sister work to a room that poetically bequeaths to Vita Sack the West, the Elizabethan inheritance she, as a woman, could not legally retain. If the boy Orlando opens the novel, slicing at the head of Moore, it is by watching Othello the more that he apprehends his own jealousy, perhaps momentarily becoming more before becoming woman, which might intersect race and gender rather interestingly. Furthermore, the poet who appears at the boy's home in the first chapter of the novel, a poet identified as Shakespeare in the index of Wolf provides in her full biography, sees beyond the house and towards a life not marked by the limits of the society of his time. This scene becomes paradigmatic for the transpositions of the character Orlando that leads her to conclude her poem, The Oak Tree. From a patriarchal legacy to the possibility of a life that would extrapolate that legacy, this is how Toby Stevens' sister captures the ghost of the, the, ghost of the poet who sees not man or woman, but perhaps, and I quote, the depths of the sea instead. At the end of her life, in a sketch of the past, Virginia Woolf retells her disputes with Toby over Shakespeare, but in this final elaboration, she inscribes the ghost of the bard in what she risks calling her philosophy. If there is no Shakespeare, Beethoven or God, 
The signature here is a gesture that marks its presence through an absence. Wolf's procedure erases Shakespeare's presence as the patriarchal hero of a paternal government, just as she had done in thinking of him as androgynous, perhaps. Contradictorily invoking his name while denying him a place of origin, Wolf frames through his works and in spite of the critics of her time, his signature as a gesture that leans towards a hidden desire. We are Shakespeare's words, Wolf tells us in parallel construction. The linking verb to be cannot be read here as a copula that links we to what is proper to us, to a sacred tree of property. On the contrary, the verb to be links Virginia Woolf's we to the possibility of being in, occupying words, Shakespeare's words. When I think of my position as an English literature professor in Brazil, the radical possibility of occupying Shakespeare that Woolf offers seems urgent in many ways. So I want to end this short presentation with Woolf's words in another text that she left, left unfinished. For in the fragments of the reader, Shakespeare reappears in excess of his name and in excess of the aesthetic and political disputes taking place in Wolfe's modernist scene and elsewhere in our here and now. For in her words, there always remains something further. How to read Shakespeare then, Wolfe answers, for more general purposes, when the ink has gone dry upon the pen to revive the sense of language or to testify when words seem motionless to the enormous possibility of speed. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen, I hope, I hope. There we go. Ah, good, okay. Uh, are you guys seeing this? There, uh, whatever it is, I want to do it. Okay, so where's my paper? Finding Shakespeare's Mind of Winter. Roseberry, ro roseberries, I love it. Roses and mulberries and Virginia Woolf's attitude towards the bard of Avon uh, by me. Although Virginia Woolf is famous for her praise of Shakespeare as having an androgynous mind in quote, incandescent, unimpeded, unquote, Many of the critics who've chronicled Wolf's relationship to the Bard have noticed the ambivalence of her associations, caught of her reactions, caught between her youthful impressions of his oppressive greatness in association with the cultural patrimony of her father and her older brother Toby, and a freer, more mature account of the embodied pleasure of reading him. Julia Briggs, for example, contrast Lily Briscoe's sense into the lighthouse that Shakespeare is, quote, a territory exclusive to men, unquote, with Mrs. Ramsey's appreciation of his sonnet 98 and the sense that Shakespeare supremely, quote, supremely expressed the life of feeling and imagination that Wolf associates with her mother and herself. My paper explores the poles of this ambivalence through the lens provided by Wolf's Shakespearean references to roses and to mulberry trees, outlining a discernible pattern throughout her career in which the meditative state of reading Shakespeare, often in darkness and lying down, is metaphorically linked both with roses and with a kind of fertile emptiness and is contrasted with her later use of a tree traditionally associated with a kind of, uh, with Shakespeare and other canonized literary greats in Three Guineas as an emblem of intellectual harlotry and creative imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Although her 1919 novel, Night and Day, was criticized for horticultural inaccuracy because of the appearance of roses at Christmas, 
Wolf often associates Shakespeare and white roses with a paradoxically fertile mind of winter. A brief references to roses in the 1918 sto short story, The Evening Party, introduces this association. Um, praising the flawless beauty of the summer night, one of the characters compares, quote, the roses showing white, unquote, through the dusk to the condition of the mind before reading Shakespeare, unquote. The 1926 essay, How Should One Read a Book, further explores the meditative possibilities of roses. Introduced as part of the ordinary domestic routine, the flowers are again aligned to the reading process. In the first version, Wolf suggests that, actually, that after actually reading a book, a time of rest and distraction is needed for the unconscious mind to fully absorb the text. Quote, but suddenly as one is picking a snail from a rose, tying a shoe perhaps, doing something distant and different, the whole book floats to the top of the mind complete. Although it may be forcing the analogy, the snail seems to embody the recursive processes of thinking and the rose on which it sits, perhaps the work as a whole. The snail on the flower disappears, however, in the revised version of the essay, as Wolf metaphorically identifies the work to be read with a, ro a, a rose bush. Quote, we must not squander our, our powers helplessly and ignorantly squirting half the house in order to water a single rose bush. We must train them exactly and powerfully here on the very spot. Later, when she again suggests the need for a period of suspension after reading and before judgment, the, the rose reappears. Wait for the dust of reading to settle, for the conflict and questioning to die down. Walk, talk, pull the pe dead petals from a rose, or fall asleep, unquote. Somewhat anom anomalously, in On Being Ill, published in January of 1926. Oh, yes, sorry, I meant to do that. Um, published in January of 1926, roses are elevated from recumbents into emblems of courageous autonomy, urging her reader to restore a perspective of sympathy after staring too long into the heartless dimensions of the sky by looking, quote, down at something very small and close and familiar, unquote, she suggests we, quote, examine the rose and discovers, quote, we have seen it so often flowering in bowls, connected it so often with beauty in its prime, that we have forgotten how it stands still and steady throughout an entire afternoon in the earth. It preserves a demeanor of perfect dignity and self-possession. Going on to imagine a world without humans, a reversion to a new ice age in which nature is conquered, Wolf asserts the lasting vitality and independence of the rose, thrusting it up, its head up undaunted in the starlight. The rose will flower, the crocus will burn. Paradoxically placing the rose in an ice field while also asserting a verticality that paradoxically allies it with the armies of the upright. Into the Lighthouse, published a year later, Mrs. Ramsey's mind falls into a state of reverie in which she feels that she was climbing backwards, upwards, shoving her way under petals of roses, during which she reads Shakespeare's Sonnet 98 from You, I Have Been Absent in the Spring focusing particularly upon the line, nor praise the deep vermilion in the rose, as the final ascent, uh, ascension to the summit of her climbing vine. I don't have time to go into this, uh, to the elaborate argument here, but the refusal to praise the redness of the rose, as opposed to the whiteness of the lily, can be seen as an alliance with the whiteness associated elsewhere with Lily Briscoe. Supine roses are once again explicitly aligned with Shakespeare in a room of one's own, where her call for a merger of manly and womanly traits and concerns, quote, some marriage of opposites, unquote, 
needed in order to fertilize the mind, returns to the idea of roses as an aid to meditation, this time serving the writer instead of the reader. Quote, the writer, I thought, once his experience is over, must lie back and let his mind celebrate its nuptials in darkness. He must not look or question what is being done. Rather, he must pluck the petals from a rose or watch the swans float calmly down the river. Considering that Shakespeare has just been presented as the exemplar of an androgynous mind, the evocation of swans floating down the river once again associates roses with the Bard of Avon. The waves also connect Shakespeare's roses with a certain calmness of mind. Neville's one rose is metaphorical and fits into other associations that Wolf makes between roses and reading and Shakespeare. Having passed through the anxiety and judgmental bitterness of youth, Neville is now content to simply to observe life, maintaining that, quote, it is better to look at a rose or to read Shakespeare as I read him here in Shaftesbury Avenue, unquote. Presenting the rose as an emblem of unvarnished innocence as an, on being ill, in his summation, Bernard describes an awakening into a separate individual in, into separate individualized consciousness as an interest entrance into quote those wondrous pastures at first so moon white radiant where no foot has been meadows of the rose the crocus of the rock and the snake too unquote once again evoking the moonlight white rose that is the mind of winter now mulberry Wolf mentions mulberry trees a total of 20 times in her prose, most frequently in her essays, where they often appear at great houses or reminders of great men. They first appear, for example, in her conclusion to her 1910 essay on, Les on Lady Hester Stanhope, where lines of mulberry trees are a sign of the imposition of order on, quote, the thicket of brambles and roses, unquote, once surrounding her grave. And Wolfe's account of the limitations constraining the life of Lady Dorothy Neville, 1919, our quote, first glimpse of the bars, unquote, surrounding Lady Neville appear at, appears at a country house in Dorsetshire where, quote, she came in contact first with the mulberry tree and later with Mr. Thomas Hardy, two obsessions which enlivened her future in the large, airily, magnificently equipped bird cage of her own country home, where she grew mulberries and cultivated silkworms, as does Cassandra Ottaway in Night and Day, published the same year, where her passion for growing silkworms results in a bedroom where, quote, the ceiling was hung with mulberry leaves, the, the windows blocked with cages. Unquote. By far the densest gathering of mulberry trees is in Wolf's fiercely feminist, feminist track of 1938 Three Guineas, where they appear nine times, almost half her lifetime accumulation, as part of the repeated parodic recitation of the nursery rhyme, Here We Go Round the Mulberry Bush, a singing game about children's hygiene, the various versions having to do with washing face, combing the hair, brushing the teeth, etc. According to Peter Cole's fascinating book on the history of the mulberry, the song can be extended indefinitely by adding on less childish but characteristically female duties, including laundry tasks such as washing the clothes, drying the clothes, wringing the clothes, and ironing the clothes. Cole's also offers a wonderfully provocative tale of origin for the nursery rhyme, citing the tradition that the song was created by the women prisoners at Wakefield Prison, just south of Leeds in North Yorkshire, who used to sing it dancing around a mulberry tree in the prison yard. And this is the mulberry tree, which died in 2017 according to the BBC at least. The rhyming chorus is repeated five times in Wolfe's essay in a gradually escalating sequence of negativity. 
At first, it's merely the old tune, which human nature, like a gramophone whose needle has stuck, is now grinding out with such disastrous unanimity, unquote. But instead of the childish gestures of mourning ablutions, Wolf's rhyme conjures up an equally infantile selfishness. Here we go round the mulberry tree, the mulberry tree, the mulberry tree. Give it all to me, give it all to me, all to me. In its next appearance, the mulberry tree has been politicized with a Marxist slam. It has become the mulberry tree of property, unquote. By its third round, the mulberry tree is an instrument of coercion. In the private house under patriarchy, women are shut up like, quote, like slaves in a harem, unquote. In the public world, women are forced to circle, quote, to circle like caterpillars, head to tail, round and round the mulberry tree, the sacred tree of property. Conjuring an image of women prisoners dancing around a monument to the thwarted privileges of making and wearing silk, an image intensified by Wolf's earlier characterization of the dictator as lying curled up like a caterpillar on a leaf in the heart of England. Wolf's call for women to fight that insect and crush him in our own country is echoed in her advice to women to join, not to join the compulsory dance of the professional system with its possessiveness, its jealousy, pugnacity, its greed. Affiling, affiliating the mulberry tree of a system of privilege that constrains women into giving up their autonomy in order to earn a living. And preparing for her final indictment uh, of the mulberry tree is quote, the poison tree of intellectual harlotry. I cannot help but feel that the bloody mass of berries that fall from mulberry trees and stain the hands as red as those of Lady Macbeth hovers in the sensory background of the allusion to the poison shed by the tree. Wolf's use of the mulberry in Three Guineas is one of the most syncretically dense of all her botanical images. Changing the bush into a tree, she implicitly links it to the long tradition of literary associations <coughs> with figures such as Shakespeare, Milton, Blake, and Keats and turns it into an ironic symbol, or should I say signature, of patriarchal and national uh, uh, literary authority. Shakespeare's Mulberry attracted so much sustained attention from literary pilgrims that in 1756, the then current owner of New Place, one Reverend Gastrel, quote, became so fed up with strangers milling around his garden and breaking off twigs from the famous mulberry that he chopped it down. And what the 18th century biographer James Boswell described as, quote, an act of Gothic barbarity, unquote. Wolf clearly knew about Shakespeare's mulberry in a diary entry about a visit to New Place in Stratford in May of 1934. She refers indeed to the Reverend Gastrel and to seeing, quote, a mulberry reputed to be the scion of the tree that grew outside Shakespeare's window, unquote. Mulberry trees are also associated with Milton and British Romantic poets. There is still a Milton's mulberry in the Fellows Garden at Christ Church, which is reputed to have been planted in 1609, though not by Milton himself. We were young for that. Blake's first biographer, Gilcrest, recorded that the young artist's first spiritual vision was of a mulberry tree in Peckham Rye, quote, filled with angels, bright angelic wings, bespangling every bough like stars. Wolf also knew about Blake's angelic mulberry in her 1917 TLS essay on literary pilgrimages, excuse my Latin, uh, Fulmina, Fulmina Amamen Silvasque, she argues against the imaginative poverty of strictly accurate descriptions by suggesting that, quote, there's no reason to think that the tree that was filled with angels was peculiar to Peckham Rye, unquote. And although she does not name the mulberry in front of Keats's house, in her 1932 essay on great men's houses, she clearly records its existence, quote, as we enter the house in which Keats lived, some mournful shadow seems to fall across the garden. A tree has fallen and lies propped. Uh, did I turn, okay. 
that the vicious circle, the dance Wolf calls women to free themselves from in Three Guineas, is in part the procession of literary greats, is supported by the end of the paragraph about intellectual harlotry, where Wolf declares that the freedom once offered by Milton and Keats has now been confined in a lecture room, rank with the fumes of stale print, listening to a gentleman who's forced to lecture or to write every Wednesday, every Sunday about Milton or about Keats, while the lilac, not the, the mulberry, sheds its branches in the garden free. The contrast between the poison drippy mulberry, for some reason it's okay, uh, uh, imprisoning women in patriarchy's confining dance and the open rose offering a site of meditative intervention could, sorry, meditative invention could not be a more vivid rendition of Wolf's opposing reactions to her two Shakespeare's. The one, a blocking figure, the sig whose signature, like Milton, closes off the view of the sky. The other, an androgynous exemplar of the potential of the word. All done. Uh, I put links here to uh, my paper will also be available on my academia.edu site. Uh, and uh, I have a much fuller, more developed uh, thing on both roses and mulberries uh, on my herbarium. Uh, cool. But now I, now I need to figure out how to not share my screen. I don't know how to do that. Someone. There should be a thing at the top, Alyssa, that says stop share, kind of in that. I have, there's a stop. thing at the top that says new share, slideshow. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so sorry, everybody. Yeah, it should say stop share someplace at the top. Next well, now to my it. screen has gone completely black. The, the host should also be able to I can stop it. it. Can yeah, you Drew, you can. Yeah, there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. that's it. Now I need to share mine. Yes. Can everyone see this? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Suzanne. Thank you, Drew. <coughs> well, this very stark, simple image on um, round level, curiously, is the end product of some weeks and months of really enjoying traipsing through Tudor England and uh, reading everybody's fabulous essays, books, and my three wonderful colleagues, and knowing that they would really deal with the text, the textual, so beautifully. But even so, and after all these years, I was really shocked at what happened. And, and uh, so I just want to share that with you for this one image. I mean, I've got loads of others, but this is the one I settled on. Wasn't it long ago, maybe two weeks at the most, I suddenly woke up one morning and I could see the image and I could see the whole exercise as requiring some cutting away, some pushing back, some some clarification at an, under, an underlying level of what this whole issue around Judith Shakespeare really was. I mean, I'm not a Shakespeare scholar. I, my three smart friends said they were doing Shakespeare. I thought, ooh, that sounds interesting. And I've always wondered about Judith. So I plunged. And out of it has come this really quite simple image. Um, but it's not really because of the way the process worked. I was lying there and <clears throat> bit by bit, all the wonderful things that I could have used but never quite grabbed me fell away and became like a kind of ornamentation that I didn't need. All that's in the image is this dichotomy between a real person, even though 
a fictionalized ancestor, both of them are. I am William, gives agency. William at least has our voice. Judith has no voice. And I'm lying here and I hear tried and died. And it blew me away. And I had to go with it then. And it's because I think underlying all of it is a, there's a power struggle within Wolf's brain all the time about hereditary ancestry and how to live with it, <clears throat> how to keep um, reabsorbing it, keep going back to it, and who Judith Shakespeare is all the time sitting there as this other kind of methodology. Anyway, there's plenty to be said, but I just wanted to point that out, that there's a difference between I am in the, and Judas tried and died. And in the end, it's Wolf still thinking about herself in that larger ancestral field of fictional, of fictional ancestors and being prepared, I think, in her work to rip and tear and absorb and carry on. So that's kind of where I was at. And it was shocking to me because it felt brutalist and I wasn't sure how the others would feel about it. But I thought, well, he goes. And as a, an image poem, an image poem, I think it works. And uh, so I offer that to you. Thanks, Drew. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, one thing, in fact, that I forgot to, uh, I was i was remiss at the beginning, I, I didn't mention that um, if you visited the Redbubble site um, and purchased any of the conference merchandise, you were uh, buying some of Suzanne's beautiful artwork on those uh, notebooks and coffee mugs and posters, etc. So I should have mentioned that earlier, I apologize. Um, so we can open this up for questions. You can, for a lot of people in here, so if you, and I can't see you all on one screen at this, at, at once, so it might be good if you use the raise hand feature at the bottom um, if you want to ask questions, I, and you can also ask them in the chat, and we'll read those out. So we'll open it up now. And Suzanne, can I drop the image in the, um, in the, in the, in the chat? Is that okay if people want to look at it again? Yeah. Okay. But whatever I, I you can whatever you can achieve there. Okay. Whoopee. <laughs> I think I can do that. Let me see. But if anybody has questions, we can start. I just texted Suzanne. I, the brutality, the, the brutalism doesn't shock me because it goes with the mulberry. Um, it, it, it intrigues me that, while I totally agree with Maria that, you know, as Wolf grows older, the patriarchal, the patrimony, patrimony associations, are, I, I think, are, are less. There's, he's, Shakespeare is still implicated. Uh, in a pow in a pow in the power structure she's rejecting in um, three guineas, and I can't tell you when I read that thing about Wakefield Prison, I, I you know I just it just rocked rocked my head. I couldn't believe it, and I and there's a website, a BBC website, all about you know when they cut the tree down and how and how, the long tradition of the of the mulberry tree at Wakefield Prison. And I kept thinking, well, damn, that explains a lot. Uh, and there is you know, and her images are brutal, and they're part of the Shiloh, your decomposition, the worm, 
you know, yeah. the worm and the poison, uh, which keeps reappearing in Wolf. So mm -hmm. I thought your image was quite appropriate. Great. Uh, we've got Christina. Yeah, I also thought there was something wonderful about the Elisa, your discussion of the mulberry trees and the silkworms and then Suzanne, what seemed like your termite tracks and then the sort of archaeological plans of the city. And I, I was wondering about, um, yeah, just that image of kind of insect life burrowing and human life burrowing and um, but yeah, I just, I, I thought those spoke to each other so well and, and just thanks everyone for the papers. They were great. Great to see you, Christina. <laughs> well, people are thinking about their questions. Can I just say, Suzanne, that while there's, of course, this sadness, <laughs> Um, in the final formulation, tried and died. I loved it that you transformed tear into tear or in rest in peace into rip. So there's yeah. also this huge yeah. affirmation of life and methodology, forceful, uh, but peaceful methodology to bring Judith back to life in your image poem. So thank you for that. Oh, and, and the double meanings of all those words, like try can mean hung. You know, there's no one, Wolf never leaves us, there's just one resonance. There's always more than one. Can I just come in, come in there on, on the back of that try? I, I, I thought very much, Suzanne, of um, Julia Kristeva's idea of, of subject in, in process, uh, which can be translated as on trial. Uh, including, including with all the force of the law in, in what trial is. And it, it, I found it very moving for that reason, this tried and died, because um, it, it, it also speaks to the persecution of um, witches in, in yep. earlier years. And um, there's a sense in which Shakespeare's sister uh, is buried at the crossroads. This, this, that it's going into that heritage too, and the idea of 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 what it means to be um, identified as anything, but to be identified as a woman is to be put on on trial in in mm. all those all those forces of 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 of, um, of, of the word, mm. and um, I I I've, I find your your image poem just amazing i mean it's it's gorgeous and it's it's powerful and it and it's the way in which the images work with the words that's so incredible there it's, it's wonderful um thank you so much for making that and um for the for the lyric compression in in every single word as as um davi says but also the way you've got those kind of um, collaged um, strips, which which look as if they're some kind of bandage almost. Uh, as, yes. Or, yeah. for, or, or prison bars also. Yeah. Well, lots, lots of things like that. Yeah, all of those yeah. things. Yeah. Oh. So, wonderful, uh, wonderful. You're a you, genius. James. Oh, you're no. just. And mm. it, it is that, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the texture of your work there is in keeping with, with wolves, which is, is often very collagistic and, and has these kind of um, hard edges banging up against each other where, where two different citational sources are, are rubbed up against one another. Anyway, I think uh, I don't want to give you all the attention, Suzanne, be because it works so well as part of um, a panel um, of, of equally amazing papers um, where 
I love the way Shakespeare in all of the papers is, is as, you know, can be reduced to this identity that, that fits with nationalism and, and a kind of fascism. And then the way in which the words of Shakespeare uh, open us to inhabit in a different way to, to find um, reparation. Um, but we don't ever find resolution, I think. So I'd, I'd mm. like to, to thank, thank you all. And um, as ever, Elissa, I mean, you just astonish me with what you find simply by chasing a flower. <laughs> I, well, you know, uh, uh, yes, it's why I keep on doing it. It's so amazing. I, the Wakefield prison thing was just like, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I just walked around with, and then it's so fascinating that all those images of imprisonment yeah. get associated with mulberries as well. Um, oh, Elissa as well. And it, it links with your work on the orchid where you, oh, yeah. where you show how the, the, you know, an innocent reference to the orchid is you just pull on that orchid and then you've got all that, you know, suffragette violence and, um, you, you know, you, you kind of <laughs> rip open Kew Gardens because then suddenly you realise, you know, where where is the hothouse? Where, where's, what is it? Where is the, the tea house in Kew Gardens? Well, yeah. it's not there because the, the so suffragettes <laughs> burnt it down. But, you know, <laughs> but you only kind of get to that by knowing about the, the kind of innocent reference to the to the orchid and it's the same with the mulberry I mean clearly you've just demonstrated that thank you <laughs> thank you wonderful mm. um we had a question from Anna in the chat and then we'll go to Varsha um uh, Anna wrote, Davi, I was very interested in the correlation you made between absence and presence. I was wondering if one can address a reading of Shakespeare by a wolf as a call for a female legacy correlating here with a room. Yeah, I think so. Yes, I think I think Maria did that beautifully in her paper, right, by showing, I mean, lifting up like this feminist Shakespearean tradition that Virginia Woolf elaborates throughout her oeuvre. I was very much enticed by Wolf's phrasing, Anna, uh, when she comes back uh, from a visit to Ireland and goes through Stratford and says that Shakespeare's forever absent present. And Agamben's idea in typical Agambenian fashion, right? He goes back to Paracelsus, thinks about astrology, astrology Kabbalah, <laughs> but this idea that a signature never necessarily implicates the presence, but the absence of a set of um, constructions of value and currencies that are inscribed within a certain name. Um, and I think Virginia Woolf anticipates this idea. Um, Maggie Hum says this, right? I think Virginia Woolf works with signatures, with these names as these gestures that open up productions of value. Of course, a further step would be to really read Shakespeare as intertext in Virginia Woolf. Like how does Othello work in Orlando, truly, because Shakespearean scholarship has established that Othello is first, or that the whole tragedy in Othello stems from um, the impossibility of interracial marriage. And perhaps that would shed light uh, on, I mean, this discussion on race in Virginia Woolf, right, in her published works, uh, or how Cymbeline works in Mrs. Dalloway for real, because it's a dirge, right? And Autka points that out. Autka says that the dirge works beautifully there uh, in Mrs. Dalloway because it mourns the two kinds of tragedies that she's describing, the war. But I would push it further because I think um, the dirge recognizes the vulnerability of these two bodies, right? The cross-dressed body um, of Imogene, right? And in a way, the cross-dressed body of Clotin as well because he's dressed as a man, but as, a, as her husband, she thinks it's her husband. Uh, so I think this would be a step further to consider how, I mean, the Shakespearean word or Virginia Woolf's reading of Shakespeare actually works to expand meaning, right, as a subliminal signature in her works. 
Uh, so we'll go ahead to okay. shot. I just wanted to build on that, Bobby, um, and also thank you, um, Maria, for such um, a fantastic um, taxonomy or cross section of, of Shakespeare. I found that incredibly useful um, and would love to have that to use more often. So thank you for that, in particular for connecting um, this piece of writing about Ophelia and Malaise, because I'd been thinking about this image of Ginny. Um, as she sort of um, is like enshrined in cool water in the waves and trying to connect it to that moment. And it feels like that Malay's painting, but I didn't have sort of an explicit connection there. And you just you just so beautifully put it there. So thank you so much for that. Um, Davi, I, two things. Um, when I was working on my dissertation and reading A, a Room of One's Own, I was thinking about um, uh, the moment where Judith Shakespeare is buried at some crossroads you know, where the omnibuses sort of cross. It's at, um, at Elephant and Castle. Mm -hmm. And um, Elephant and Castle is the tavern where Antonio is supposed to meet Sebastian in, mm -hmm. in Twelfth Night. And I always thought it was really remarkable that that figure of Judas Shakespeare was somehow enshrined at this site of sort of putated same-sex love in 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 twelve in the in the twelfth night, oh, yes. um, and I don't didn't really have a way to sort of necessarily think about it because it's not direct citation, but this idea of the signature is so helpful in thinking about how that might be working. Um, so thank you for that. And and the other, I have two questions for you. Um, one is about the larger structures of Shakespeare's signature, because I've been thinking about how a Winter's Tale might show up as a, as a macro structure for to the lighthouse. And then also um, the tempest as, as, a, as, a, um, as a way of thinking about between the acts. And so I was wondering if that, if you thought about that at all. I didn't, but I'll write it down and I'll think about it soon. <laughs> um, this is not really a research project. I, I wrote, this is truly like a version of a personal essay I wrote for this collection, which was for the, common reader, uh, let's use Virginia Woolf's phrasing, right? Um, but I think that what you say is so interesting because I think the signature, Woolf's signature, the fact that it's elephant and castle, I mean, it hides perhaps the most problematic um, aspects that sometimes even feminist criticism forgets when reading Woolf, uh, for instance, just to affirm that there is this gender fluidity on the Elizabethan stage because of these young boys cross-dressing is kind of awkward because it is misogyny that creates the possibility of cross-dressing at the end of the day, right? It is the fact that women could not perform that creates the possibility of gender transgression on the Elizabethan stage. And I think this is something Wolf is quite aware when she works with Shakespeare um, contiguously. Sorry, Elisa, I, I lost I said it. I said the transgression, but the transgression only goes one way. That is, Clearly. the boys transform into women, but the women don't transform onto men exactly. on the stage. So Judith could not participate, take part in any yeah. sort of encounter, be it on the stage or in real life around Elephant and Castle, only in death, right? Yeah. Tried and died. <laughs> uh, Varsha yeah. has had her hand up for a while. Let, let, Varsha, would you like to go? Um, I'm joining the uh, campaign for um, Suzanne's um, artwork on a t-shirt, please, <laughs> <laughs> first of all. Um, absolutely love it. And um, the collaging as well is reminding me so much of panels on fragments and also Maria's paper on reading these um, sort of insertions um, as uh, Wolf makes a feminist um, Shakespeare. Um, so, yeah, yes, please uh, put me on the waiting list. <laughs> but um, to speak to um, Davi's papers and actually all of your papers, um, just to flag up, um, Davi, that actually, um, I, I, if you haven't read it, then Celia Dylider uh, uh, writes about Othello's sister and racial hermaphrodite. Uh, hermaphroditism in Virginia Woolf's Othello. So she kind of draws out the kinds of connections 
um, that you were um, sort of mapping out here. Um, but I'm also wondering about your uh, method of reading, um, Virginia Woolf's method of reading Shakespeare. Um, and in both of your papers, Marianne Davi, and um, you are sort of thinking about Virginia Woolf arguing for a displacement of Shakespeare, even if we use uh, kind of, you know, even if she uses him. Um, and I wondered, if there are links here to be mined with global Shakespeare disciplines now, which works in exactly this kind of way of studying Shakespeare, but then displacing him as this kind of um, national white uh, British um, sort of um, poet. So I wondered if there are some very productive connections to be made. Um, especially given that you are uh, talking uh, from Brazil as well, and there's a lot of global Shakespeare there. Thank you so much for your question, because I saw a lecture of yours in Cambridge uh, Literature, and it was wonderful, and I loved, and that gave me the inspiration to write this paper. And uh, because here in Brazil, people know a lot of Shakespeare too. Thinking about this displacement that you are talking about. And we had a um, Jornada on Shakespeare. That is a week on Shakespeare. And that was fabulous. So many different productions. And, so many people thinking about Shakespeare on different ways that I have never imagined. So it opened my mind to see Shakespeare in different languages, different uh, in uh, talking about race, uh, races, in different races as well. So that was wonderful. And listening to your paper was marvelous. Thank you so much. Yeah. Asha, thank you so much for your question and for your suggestion. I haven't read it and I would love to read it. The Orlando Otello thing came out in the questions because it's something I was thinking about earlier. I even sent Derek Ryan <laughs> a message during the plenary <laughs> earlier. And I added it here as a suggestion. I did read Janet Adelman's work on race in Othello, and of course, Annual Lumba's fantastic work on post-colonial Shakespeare is something I usually bring out to students in Brazil when I teach Shakespeare. So yes, I am 100% with you on global Shakespeare's and productive bridges we can um, make while reading Virginia Woolf and Shakespeare, but I would love to read this specific paper on Orlando and Othello if you can send me the reference later. Thank you so much. We might have time for one last question, I think, from Anna in the chat. Uh, Maria, you comment on the presence of Shakespeare and Wolf as a theatrical form in between the acts. You also see a passage through the theatrical rhythmic capacity for the Wolfian text in the sense of a poetic exchange. Yes, Anna, thank you for your question. I think that are so many things to explore in between the acts that I didn't have the time to, you know, that would be another paper, right? A different paper, only in between the acts and Shakespeare, because there are so many things to explore there. So many plays that she uh, comments and we didn't have time to talk about, like, um, just one moment, let me find here in my paper the, the version I have here. So for sure she's talking about as you like it, the tempest, or maybe uh, a girl disguised as a boy. She could be relating to uh, the Peter saying, as you like it, Twelfth Night and Cymbeline. So I think that I, uh, it has to do with the rhythm in between the, the acts. 
And uh, when she says that the plot is not what is the most important, but the rhythm as well as in the waves, right? Yeah, so there are so many things to talk about between the ads. Yeah, and we also have Romero and Juliet, Harry Ford, uh, the play out of the play and the play within the play as a reference to Hamlet. And we have references to Macbeth and King Lear. So that would be not only a paper, but a whole uh, thesis on Shakespeare in between the acts. Yes. Thank you for the question, Anna. Well, I think we should thank everybody for this terrific panel. Thank you, Davi and Alyssa and Maria and Suzanne. Uh, terrific work. Lovely way to end the official activities of the day, I'd <laughs> say. Um, so. Thank you, Drew. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. This was a pleasure. Um, so take care, everyone. Enjoy the social hour, which I believe starts now. And um, oh, will... I'm happy to stay here, but I've lost my Zoom. What? Maybe we could, oh, maybe, yeah. maybe we could yeah. stop the recording. Stop yeah. the recording, yeah. Oh and yes, stay in Gotham. Jane DeGay had asked me a question in the Oh right.